uh, come here and uh, uh, share with you some of the work that we've done. But let me highlight that what I'm going to be presenting it was done by Vikash Goel and Jimmy Sunway. So they're two fabulous students at the University of Warwick. Okay. Um, yeah, so a bit more background about Coralis AI. So uh, we are here in one of the offices. There's actually five offices across the country. And Coralis AI is, is a research institute that's been funded by World Bank of Canada. So we are working on, on a number of problems. Perhaps what's interesting is that uh, compared to other research centers, we do what we call integrated research. So we start from applied problems and then uh, we go all the way to the fundamental research and then publish as well. Um, so in terms of research, that includes most of the uh, exciting topics in AI, so machine learning, reinforcement learning, and all the supervision of private AI, fintech, and so on. Uh, so in any case, if any of you are interested uh, to learn more about Buzz AI, yeah, feel free after my talk. I'd love to chat with uh, the researchers here, and uh, it's an exciting place. Okay. Um, as Marin was explaining, so I actually wear two hats. Uh, so I am a professor at the University of Waterloo half of the time. The other half of my time is spent here at LSAI. Well, when I say here, I mean in Waterloo, but still at LSAI. Um, so with the University of Waterloo, so uh, my group is working on a number of topics. Uh, so uh, I was very tempted to give a talk uh, that could touch on as many things as possible. But then, you know, at this point, I would not be going to depth about anything that, that would be frustrating. So I figured, let me just pick one thing, one thing that I think is exciting and tell you about it. So, so today I'm gonna to talk about motion-oriented reinforcement learning. Um, we'll see in a moment what that is. But in any case, if any of you are interested in any of those other topics, I'm, I'm happy to talk about them. Okay, um, so here's the outline for today. So first, I'll, I'll give a bit of background about reinforcement learning, and in particular, one major problem, data and efficiency. Uh, we'll see a solution uh, that's within the paradigm of self-supervised learning. I'll explain this in a moment. And then the particular solution, we call it motion-oriented reinforcement learning. And then the key is that I'm gonna tell you how we can do unsupervised object and motion recognition that will allow a reinforcement learning agent to, to think at a higher level instead of thinking at a pixel level. So most of the work in deep reinforcement learning with image-based environments have the, the challenge that you start from pixels and then uh, you know there's, there's a lot that uh, the agent has to learn and figure out because it's starting from low-level information. But in comparison, we as humans, when we start planning and so on, then we often start doing this at a much higher level because um, the lower level part has been taken care of. And then, so this is where we thought, okay, there's some opportunities to combine some work from computer vision. And, and in this case, it's gonna be techniques for unsupervised object and motion recognition. And then this will help us speed up reinforcement learning and basically address the data and efficiency problem. Okay, so yeah, so that's the menu for today. And then if you want more details afterwards, that's the associated paper. Okay, so very briefly, reinforcement learning. Um, we've got an agent, this can be a computer system of any sort. It executes actions that have an effect on the environment. And then in terms of figuring out what it should be doing, instead of being told precisely what's the right thing as in supervised learning, instead it receives some rewards. So that's some feedback and numerical signal that tells it how good uh, the actions are. And, and then it will try to maximize that so that in the long run, it learns how to uh, select the best actions possible. Okay, so there's lots of um, applications for this. So I've listed some of them here. We can think of reinforcement learning as essentially one of the most comprehensive form of machine learning because uh, that encompasses and states a lot of problems, uh, including um, issues related to active learning, representation learning, and, and, and so on. So, so that's essentially the beauty of also the challenge with reinforcement learning. So we can do a lot, but obviously doing it well is difficult. Um, okay, so in any case, um, that's why then it's, it's also exciting to do research in this. 
and, and let's see how we can attempt to speed up the knowledge. Okay, so if we look at reinforcement learning from a data efficiency perspective, um, a lot of the successes have been in simulated environments. So we had the computer book that was uh, uh, a big success several years ago, you can generate as much data as you want through a simulator. Um, Atari is another good example, video games, again, you can generate as much data as you want. In robotics, people use simulators as well. This is video games again. So in general, many of the successes that we've all heard of rely on, on, on this uh, property that um, in, some, in some environments, you have a simulator and therefore data is not an issue. But in the industry, that's not the case. And very often we like to have some techniques that can learn um, much more quickly, perhaps at the same rate that humans would, would learn as well. And, and that you know, poses some challenges. Okay, so just to quantify things a little bit. Um, so in 2017, there was a paper by Shulman et al. that um, compared several baselines. This was in the Atari domain. And if you look carefully at those graphs, what's important is in fact the x-axis. So this shows the number of frames that were used for training an agent to play various Atari games. Uh, the the y-axis is, is the reward, so higher is better. But the key is that to get a, a good policy in most of those domains, it was taking on the order of 40 million frames. Okay, so 40 million frames is a lot of data. Obviously, if you're playing video games, it's just a simulator. It doesn't matter how long it takes. But still, if you compare that to a human playing Atari games, uh, humans can play way faster. Uh, you know, if, if, if you're put in front of a game that you've never played, often you'll pick up the game in a couple of trials and maybe you're not gonna be an expert immediately, but you can get good level relatively quickly, right? So there's a huge gap between what our algorithms can achieve and what humans can do. Okay, so now let's have a look at how um, deep reinforcement learning typically works. So if we're in a visual domain, like Atari, then we feed in a sequence of images about the game. And then typically we've got some type of deep neural networks, most of the time some form of convolutional neural network that will either compute some actions if it's an actor or some values if it's a critique. Doesn't matter, the point is that it, it essentially computes these things, and, and then there's going to be some reward that's used to uh, train the parameters. But now if we look at this picture, what's interesting is that we have a reward, and here I just put a dot to indicate that it's just a tiny bit of information. And in fact, in some games, um, typically you, you would just win or lose at the end, so you get a very sparse reward because you have to execute lots of actions just to find out if at the end you win or lose, and that's your one hit. Yeah. Can you give another few examples of uh, reward? Reward uh, So, yeah, okay, if it's not games, like let's see. Um, Even in this game, like uh, aside from winning, what, what are the other positive? Okay, so in, in, in various games, it's going to be points as well. So, so then, you know, often there's a score, like let's say you're playing Tom, then each time that you score against the opponent, you win a point, so, so then uh, points would, would be um, another form of signal that would be used as, as reward. So in any case, anything that, that would typically be measurable and numerically uh, can be used for purpose. Okay, so yeah, so in many environments it's sparse. Even when it's not sparse, let's say that every time step we get a reward, that's just one number. And now the problem is that we've got this deep neural network here, fairly complex, that ingests images, fairly large, right? And this deep neural net will typically have on the order of millions of counters. So now if you think about it, you've got one number, maybe every time step, that's used to train millions of counters, we've got an imbalance. And at some level, it's no surprise if it takes 40 million frames or 40 million time steps to get a good policy because, well, we've got millions of counters here. So yes, you do need on the order of millions of, uh, of reward signal in order to train millions of counters, right? So, um, so that explains, at least at some level, 
part of the reason why it, it does take so long for reinforcement learning to, to converge. And any questions regarding this? Good? Okay. All right, so now let's come back to our picture about reinforcement learning. So I explained that the agent executes actions, receives some reward, but then there's another arrow here that was there originally, but I didn't really talk about it. So you typically get some observations as well that tell you what is the state of the environment, what well, is some information about the state of the environment. And that, that's not only used to condition the choice of action, but that's additional information. And, and an interesting question is, can we leverage that to perhaps have more signals for training? And then, so in self-supervised learning, very often, what we do is that we craft some additional auxiliary tasks or objectives that will um, help us train a lot of those patterns. It's not necessarily towards maximizing rewards, but uh, it will help us get the patterns into um, some range where um, then it's, it, we, we don't need as much rewards for, for fine-tuning them. So, so accelerate tasks can be quite powerful in terms of speeding up, accelerating the training. Maybe the way I would put it is uh, that it helps the learner figure out how the world works, uh, which of course you would imagine helps to solve the task. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. So I guess yeah. Then we can think of those auxiliary tasks as like you know, let's get some. Uh, general, general common sense background knowledge, and then after that, it's a lot easier, or at least we're better prepared to tackle the, the real tasks that we care about. Yeah. Okay, so, so here concretely, things that we can do are, for instance, since we get an observation at every step, maybe we could just see if we can predict future observations. This would tell us, for instance, how the environment is going to evolve over time. And if you're trying to select actions in order to win a game, being able to predict future observations is essentially saying that you can predict what, how the game is going to evolve. And obviously that is something useful. If you can't predict how the game is going to evolve, how can you select good actions, right? So, so from that perspective, then, um, yeah, predicting future observations, um, even though that's not the goal, can be very, very informative. And here, we don't have just to, to do it this way. We could also um, do predictions that can be in any direction. So we could pass observations, but also just do some form of autoencoder and, and do some reconstruction so that we, we can uh, do some representation learning that's more effective. So there's lots of variants. There's a whole literature on doing this. Okay. So concretely, for us, what this means is that as I explained before, for deep reinforcement learning that's image-based, normally we have this problem where there's an imbalance of a sparse reward that has to train millions of patterns in the neural net. But once we augment um, the training with some auxiliary tasks, for instance, if I simply try to predict what the next image is, then the next image might have on the order of millions of pixels. That's millions of numerical signals. And, and now um, it gives me a lot more information for training my neural network. Obviously, my neural net is not going to be the same anymore because now it has to output a lot more things if it predicts what the next uh, frame is going to be. But still, uh, part of that neural net can still be used for calculating actions and, and, and values, and then uh, it, the training gets fed up in, in this fashion. So in any case, the beauty is that now the question becomes, how can we leverage other things to get a dense signal and then speed up the learning? Okay, so um, another issue, uh, especially in the case of, of games, is the type of prior knowledge that perhaps humans have versus computers. So if you, if you look at those games, um, in fact, when we did this research, I had heard of Atari games, never played any of them, my students just came into my office, showed me some of those games, and even though I never played, I could immediately tell what's going on. So here in Sequest, nobody has to tell me, but I can figure out that there's a submarine that's shooting some things, there's some swimmers that are moving around, and, and then I've got a score that might go up or down up there. And then for Space Invaders, it's easy to figure out that your agent is down here and shooting some monsters up there. So 
will come uh, or break out. We've got a panel, and essentially, we want to make sure the bone doesn't fall down, and, and, and then we'll gradually destroy the skin, right? So, so here we see um, we can naturally figure out these things, and uh, that's the beauty. When you start playing those games, right, then you start immediately thinking in terms of what's going to be my strategy. But now you might ask, well, when does a computer see its death? So for reinforcement learning, what we're really feeding in, which is the same information, the same images, well, for the computer, it's, it's a sequence of pixels. So, so that's like just one large array. And, and then the first thing it has to do is figure out how to interpret all of those numbers, right? So what if I, instead of showing you those frames to play the game, I was going to feed you with a matrix of pixel intensities, right? Could you play the game well? How long would it take you, right? So most of us would just fail miserably, and it wouldn't matter how long we would try. So our allegiance are essentially right now uh, put into this really uh, challenging paradigm where you know the real problem is not actually figuring out how to choose actions here, it's, it's just figuring out how to interpret those pixels. So there's a case of humans doing something like this. Uh, you know, blind people who are learning to see from uh, sensors that send signals on their mouth, on their tongue. They, it's like they have to build a visual system out of, out of the tongue sensors, and so they really have to build around the ground up. And they are able to, 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 to do it to some extent. I mean, not yeah. the high resolution. This is not, uh, so humans can do it. I don't know what yeah. the numbers are. <laughs> I don't think they play video games. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So okay. I, I guess yeah. I, I should give more credit to humans here. So yeah, <laughs> we are capable of, of really difficult things, uh, and we still have the upper hand. I think that's the that's the ana analogy. Like yeah, yeah. And, and it also because you can't use your prior knowledge from evolution. Like your tongue was not meant to see. So it's really. Um, blank slate. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so in any case, now let's say we want to level the playing field between humans and computers. I would argue here that, um, okay, from, for humans, for us, um, the way we immediately get to understand what's going on is that we do recognize objects and then we also see how they move and, and then we can start planning based on this. So from that perspective, right, and in, in video games, very often what matters are objects and, and their motion. Well, can we leverage this to essentially provide higher level information to an RL agent and, and then speed up the, the learning? Okay, any other questions regarding this? Good. Okay. All right, so, so now, um, what I'm proposing is that, well, um, in our framework for deep reinforcement learning, where we've got a deep neural network here, um, we need to realize that these, this deep neural net is really responsible of two things. It's responsible of doing the feature extraction. I mean, that's the beauty of deep neural networks. Nobody transcribes the features, but still, that explains why it's taking so long, because it has to learn how to for the features, and after that is, is doing policy optimization. But if we could get it to uh, focus more on the policy optimization and, and essentially do something to uh, ease the burden on, on the feature extraction and application, then perhaps we could get a speed up. And, and this is where, again, we're going to look at extracting um, well, segmenting objects and getting their motion. So, yeah, so then again, in those games, right, if we can simply um, get a computer to learn how to segment the objects and feed that to a reinforcement learning feature, then we should be able to get uh, some nice stuff. Okay, there we go. Um, okay, so, so now I'll introduce our technique for doing this, Laurel. Um, and yeah, the benefit. It will be that as a byproduct of recognizing the objects and, and their motion, then not only are we going to be able to do positive optimization faster, but also have a greater interpretability of the policy. Okay, so the technique has two phases. 
Um, in phase one, we're going to do the segmentation, and I'll show you how we can do it in roughly 1% of the frames that a normal deep RL agent would take. So um, the segmentation I argued earlier is, is, is really the part that is difficult from an RL perspective, but it turns out that if we leverage computer vision techniques, then that doesn't have to be so onerous, and in fact, we'll see how we can do it in an unsupervised way, and then we'll just use 1% of the frames. Now, during that phase, our agent is going to execute random actions, and here, it's not a big deal because if it's just 1% of the frames at the beginning, even if we try to get our agent to be smart and pick good actions, well, since it doesn't know anyway how to interpret uh, the frames, then it would, it would effectively be executing random actions. So there's no loss really in, in executing random actions. But, but wouldn't you get something uh, more representative of the kinds of images that you would get in the game if you were to use a, a better policy here, right? Because maybe you get stuck at the beginning, like level one, and you never go to level two if you don't do good policy. Absolutely. Okay. So, so yeah, I guess here, this phase is just going to be about doing the segmentation. In the second phase, where we're going to do the policy optimization, the truth is we're going to continue to learn how to segment so that if, let's say, it's a game with multiple levels or different screens, then it can continue to learn how to segment what matters in, in the rest of the game. Okay, but yeah, the beauty is that now you see the policy optimization is going to be both based on round pixels as usual, but also based on the objects that have been segmented in your motion. So that's higher level information, and we'll see that we can get a speed up doing that. Okay, so in terms of computer vision, uh, the problem of um, segmentation can be thought as follows. So let's say we've got a scene and we want to segment out. Uh, different things like buildings versus the road versus cars versus the pole and so on. And it's a problem of essentially um, uh, classifying different pixels in, in, into different classes. Now, obviously, if we do this in a supervised way, it's labor intensive, and the computer vision uh, community has lots of ways of, of doing this in an unsupervised way, and that's what we'll leverage to. Now, from a reinforcement learning perspective, it would also be completely uh, impractical if we had to use some supervised technique because then that would mean that we'd have to somehow tell the agent how to do the segmentation first and, and then after that it could start using this. But if we use an unsupervised technique from the start, then uh, it will be the same as if we were using any other type of reinforcement learning technique. Okay, so the ideas that we're going to leverage are nothing new. Uh, so we're going to leverage optical flow. So for instance, if you've got a scene and then there's a person cycling, two pedestrians, and you simply measure the flow of every pixel, then um, you notice that objects tend to, objects that are in motion or people that are in motion tend to have uh, flows for their pixels that are roughly the same. So it already kind of gives you a sense that perhaps there's an object here and where you might want to do the second. Um, yeah, so these are just examples. Now, uh, concretely, um, in, our, in our work, we leverage uh, some previous work that was done at Google in 2017. Uh, they propose a network called SFMNet, which stands for Structure from Motion. Um, this is only one of many networks, so uh, there were many networks proposed to do similar things. Um, here briefly, what this network does is that it takes as input a pair of frames. Um, the top part is computing camera motion, object motion, as well as uh, some object mass, and eventually uh, uh, estimates the flow of every pixel. The bottom part um, takes care of depth information in 3D environments, so it estimates depth, and then that helps to also um, calibrate what the flow is going to be because a motion of an object that is false versus far will look different in terms of the flow and, and, and so that, that's important. Okay, so this network can do uh, or can be trained in an unsupervised way to do segmentation of objects simply because um, what it does is that it, it estimates flow at the end. Once you've got the flow, you can add this to 
your first frame, and then that gives you a prediction for your second frame. You compare it to the ground truth for your second frame, and then you can back propagate through the entire network. Okay. So yeah. So again, this is just one example of a network that okay. does that. There's lots. So did he use the actual like third frame or one of the, the two that always uses? Uh, one of the two that was used as input. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, what was the answer? I didn't hear it, sorry. Oh, so yeah, it, it, it uses, so what, when it does the prediction, it essentially just predicts the second frame that was used as input. Okay, so here we only use two frames, and we, we can think of this as like some form of structured autoencoder because the input is, well, the output is part of the input. Okay, so we're simply going to reconstruct the second frame, and here, just by how the network has been designed, there's enough structure to constrain uh, some of these uh, blocks to be interpretable as camera motion, object motion, and, and also object mass. Okay, uh, so that's that's the beauty. Okay. Any any additional questions regarding this? How well does it work? Okay, so. Um, in the paper for SFMNet, uh, they had some of those results. These were based on the Kitty data set. Uh, so they, they took some scenes um, for, taken by uh, cameras at some intersections. I believe this is in the context of uh, uh, smart city type research. So, and the problem is, can we segment tap vehicles that are coming and leaving? And then, so here, you've got, what you're really interested in is to segment out the moving objects. So, so then it learns how to do this automatically. We can see the predicted motion mask in this column. This is the ground truth here, so it tends to work quite well uh, for the top two rows. Uh, the bottom two rows, uh, it did not work well. Um, you can also look at the predicted flow versus the ground truth flow. So you can see that this approach is not perfect, but it is doing something reasonable. So here, I'm, I'm going to claim that for our perspective, because I'm going to show you how to use that in a reinforcement learning. I'm not actually interested in having a perfect segmentation, right? So think of it like, let's say you're driving a car, right? And you're trying to control the car, so you need to know where are the obstacles, what the distance to other cars, and so on, but you could not answer precisely like what's the distance at the millimeter level for all the obstacles and so on. So you could not segment that in your head perfectly what's in the scene, but you know roughly where things are and that's sufficient for you to drive a car, right? So here's going to be the same idea for reinforcement learning. I'm not interested in a perfect segmentation. I just need a reasonable segmentation that will tell me where the objects are and roughly what their motion is and that, that's going to be sufficient for planning. Yeah. Okay, so we applied this, or at least I'll show you a moment how to combine SFMNet with reinforcement learning in the context of Atari games. Now, Atari games have actually very simple graphics. Uh, the graphics are 2D, so we don't need the 3D part. And, and this, what we did is we simplified SFMNet just to 2D. Um, concretely, what that means is that we essentially removed the bottom part that was about uh, leveraging and recognizing depth information. So we don't need that. We can just focus on the top part. And, and then here we, we had to do a few additional modifications to make this work. But essentially, it's the same architecture. So we've got two frames as input. We have some convolutional layers. We get an embedding here. From the base, we compute object and camera translation. If we're in 2D motion, uh, can be summarized here just as translation. So we just have some simple vectors for that. And then the top part here is computing some object mass, but then we combine. So there's going to be um, one translation per object mass. And then that gives us uh, an estimate of optical flow that we can add to the first frame to predict what the second frame is and then back propagate through uh, the entire network. Any questions regarding this? So yeah. what, what, what's happening at each of these uh, uh, stride, stride four to, what does this mean? 
Oh, okay, so the, the, these are just counters for your clinically shown neural network. So whenever you've got your filters, the stride will indicate when you take your filter, right? So you apply it, uh, uh, you know, just by shifting it by one each uh, all the time. And here, stride four would mean that you need a shift by four, okay? Yeah, by four pixels. And then stride two, we just shift by two. Okay. So yeah, so these are just... Uh, Patterns of, of, of the convolutional neural networks. Okay. So, so in any case, yeah, these, these are just standard convolutional layers. Um, obviously, I mean, there's some differences in, in different implementations, but it's uh, just a basic um, implementation here that gives us an embedding. And then from this, we've got additional layers where the goal is to get object maps and also translation. Okay. All right, so in terms of, uh, yeah, beyond simplifying this to 2D, we did some additional modifications, um, and this is the art of deep learning. Uh, so when we took SFMNet and started using it and so on, the first reaction my students were had was like, how come Google published this? It's not working. And then, <laughs> So, so in any case, they were doing some adaptations, and, and then one of the things that we did is remove all the stiff connections that we had um, in the original network. So this is pretty common to have stiff connections to speed up the learning, also help to remember information from the past. But if the goal is to get camera object motion and, and also object masks, um, then, and, and, and it comes from this middle embedding here, then we want to make sure that the information uh, captured here is sufficient. And we don't want to have anything that would bypass that, otherwise um, we wouldn't get um, the right information. So we remove the skip connections. Um, we also use a different um, loss function. So um, the most basic thing would just be to uh, measure reconstruction loss by minimizing Euclidean error. But in the case of images, that's a bad idea, simply because um, Euclidean loss does not align well with um, uh, what is uh, uh, big, yeah, what, what, what humans would tend to see as, as differences. So there's a whole literature in computer vision on about other losses. So we use a structural dissimilarity for that. Um, we also did some regularization um, to make sure that the object mass and the flow information is uh, as tight and as small as possible. So otherwise there's a chance that it will recognize as an object like the entire background, just give it like a very small uh, uh, motion and that would be kind of okay. But then with this, we can make sure that these types of artifacts don't occur. Um, and then finally, we also did curriculum learning. So here, um, we started with uh, our reconstruction loss to get um, good prediction that uh, gives us rough uh, segmentations. But then in terms of making the segmentations more precise and so on, and this is where we uh, start gradually increasing the importance of the L1 regularization. So what's the hidden part of the equation? <coughs> Okay, so this is an artifact of our communication system. So, yeah, let's move it down. Yeah, yeah so it's, this is just a weight with the regularization loss. We're simply increasing the importance of the regularization. So, you just had a fixed value a bit more? So, if, if we start with um, the regularization loss immediately, then the problem is that. Um, it's, you know, we're asking it to solve a hard problem, it might get stuck, and the students found out that they were not getting good results consistently. By starting with no Just hard like setting it to zero, for example. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, whereas, yeah, if we just start with the reconstruction loss, then it, it tends to find some rough segmentations that, that are far from perfect and often include more pixels than needed. And then by including the regularization loss gradually, then um, it, it, it forces it to, to be more precise. Okay, so that's roughly what the TK means. The time? 
Uh, here that's that. the translation. So here we've got an object mass with a translation, so that's the motion. <coughs> Any other questions? All right, so just to illustrate, so if we take the game of breakout or pump, uh, we feed in two frames, that's our input here. Then uh, the network will compute some object mass, so we can see here in green. Uh, this, is, this one here is the sum of all the object mass. Here, this is the most salient mass. In this game, there's effectively just a paddle and a ball that are moving, so that's what we want that's what we wanted to recognize in segment tap. That's exactly what it does, and then it gives more importance to, to the paddle. Uh, we also have the optical flow color coded here that indicates the direction of the motion. Okay. Now, as you can see, the segmentation is far from perfect, right? Like we don't have clean segmentation, but again, the point is that this is not the output, that's not the goal. We're going to feed that to a reinforcement learning agent, and that's just going to be. Uh, enough in terms of high level information. Pong is similar, we have two paddles instead, and it does a good job too. Um, here are three more games Sequest, Space Invaders, Dream Rider. Um, it recognizes the objects as well, roughly. Uh, Space Invader is interesting because here we've got a whole bank of monsters that are moving. Uh, in fact, here is a question about how many objects can we recognize. And then uh, our implementation is essentially such that we simply start with an upper bound on a number of objects that can be recognized, like 20. Um, but then those objects, an object here, we don't enforce um, that the object be uh, contigu uh, contiguous. So uh, it can be different regions of pixels that are uh, simply moving with the same motion. And it turns out here that all of those monsters always move in a synchronized way. So there's more than 20 of them in here, but then uh, we manage still to recognize them um, simply because they have the same motion. Now ideally, they would be recognized as a single object because they are literally moving in a synchronized way, but still um, you can see the most salient object was uh, different parts of each uh, uh, monster, but uh, when we do the sum, we can get all of them. So, yeah, so that gives you a sense how well it did here. The last one, Beam Rider, is a very interesting game because um, there's some visual artifacts in this game that are, in fact, completely irrelevant to the game. So, it's called Beam Rider because we have some vertical lines that are beams that are essentially just flowing down the screen and they're just a visual artifact. They, they have no impact um, in the game. And then, so, our technique does what it's supposed to do in the sense that it recognizes the beams as moving and it segments them out. But then the problem is that because those tend to be um, more important in terms of number of pixels and, and, and so on, then often it fails to recognize our agent or even some of the bullets that are being shot and, and also the, uh, uh, the little monsters that are in fact very very, very small and barely visible. Okay. So we'll see in a moment that this is an example of a game where our approach did not work well because we're essentially going to feed it with noise from having recognized beams that don't matter. Any questions regarding this? So your big hypothesis is that because you want to summarize the but you want to take the noise away, in majority of games, the most important information is the moving object. That's, that's the big hypothesis. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, so that's our hypothesis. And, and obviously, this will not work everywhere. And then there are means where uh, you know, there might be a bomb or a treasure that's static, there's a boom, and we won't pick that up. Yeah. Um, so I, I kind of don't understand the point of this game. Did you say that the beams are the artifacts of the network? Uh, no, the, the, the beams are just a visual artifact in the game. Okay, so in fact, um, I might as well show you some of the videos. So I guess you can see this is the game um, being played on the left hand side, and you can see there are some beams that are just flowing down, and that's just part of the graphics of the game. Okay, but they, they actually don't matter really. 
Some upsampling right here, you get to be object analysis. Because it's like it's a very common um, problem in fully convolutional networks. But if you if you use com, um, convolutional transport layers and uh, stride bigger than one, it introduces the artifacts to, to your final image. Okay. So most people do this bilinear interpolation or something like that. Okay. Yeah, very good point. So here, uh, yeah, my students did that. Um, neither my students nor me are experts in computer vision for this. Um, so they took um, what was common in the literature at, at the time and tried it, and it worked reasonably well. But uh, now that you're suggesting this, perhaps we should consider um, other types of um, uh, layers Binding your layers to, to do this more precisely. Yeah. Okay. okay, so we're now ready to combine this with reinforcement learning. Um, so, what I've got here is a top part that corresponds to our segmentation network. Uh, so, I've just simplified it here. And the bottom part is just a classic. The reinforcement learning architecture for visual domains. So, in the sense that the source from inputs, there's typically a bunch of convolutions, and then after that, we feed the embedding to an actor network that will compute some action, a predictive network that will compute some values. And here, um, for what we're proposing, it doesn't matter what type of actor or critique we use, our technique can be combined with essentially any type of reinforcement learning. The, the main thing that we are doing here is essentially creating a link here. So then a, a path allows us to feed uh, an embedding of the um, object mask and the, uh, uh, the motion information that gets concatenated with whatever has been processed from the raw pixel and fed into the actor critique network. So, so, yeah, so our contribution is really in terms of combining this with um, any classic reinforcement learning architecture simply by concatenating the high level information with the low level information. And here for training this network, so we have classic maximum maximizing of rewards done for uh, the bottom part and then minimizing optical flow error for the top. So here, at the beginning, for the first 1% of frames, we're simply going to train the top part of the network to learn how to segment. Um, we don't bother training the bottom part at the beginning because it, you know, executing random actions or otherwise executing whatever comes out of here would, would be roughly the same, it would be random anyway. Okay. After that 1%, then we start training the bottom part as well. And we continue training the top part too. So now we see uh, both objectives are essentially used to train this part of the network. Right? So the bottom part is still only trained by rewards. This part here is only trained with uh, minimizing optical flow error. But then this part here gets trained by both. Yeah. And you've taken out all of the skip connections. Yeah. So we, yeah, we still removed all the skip connection so that this embedding layer, um, yeah, so I guess, yeah, what's interesting is that we put a connection from the embedding layer to the reinforcement learning region as opposed to a connection from the explicit object mask and the explicit motion um, vectors, because that would have been the natural thing to do. In fact, that was the first thing my students tried. They tried it and it just wasn't robust, it just wasn't working. And, and then this is where deep learning is an art. So at some point, reading out of papers and so on, 
they just tried what if we use an earlier layer that corresponds to an embedding where the information is present because um, the object mask information has to flow through this layer here. So that means we still have the object information here and the motion as well. It shows that it's in a different form. Here it's, it's in an embedding form. Okay? And it's just one large vector of 512. And then when we feed that in, it just works better. So I guess for this, my hypothesis is that um, from an optimization perspective, we still have challenges, and here it might just be the case that um, by doing this, we're helping the optimization not getting stuck into local optimum as much. Had we had better optimization, perhaps uh, just feeding in the explicit object mask and motion translation would have worked just fine too. But yeah, that's that's my my hypothesis. So we'll have to see in the future when better optimization comes along whether that, that was really the case. So, any questions regarding this? Yeah. Uh, did you try using like uh, relation networks in the downstream uh, part of the, uh, the reinforcement learning network or the policy? So what, what do you mean by relation network? I guess sort of more like a graph. So when you have like a set of objects, it can be, I guess, a good way to exploit them or like process them well is to use like a graph neural network or like a relation type network. Right, yeah, that, that's a great idea. We, we haven't done this, and in fact, yeah, that's what we will be thinking for, for future work. Okay, so um, when we combine our approach with some baselines like A to C, TPO, these are baseline reinforcement learning techniques. Um, so then we do better than those baselines. Uh, for instance, our approach combined with A to C compared to just plain A to C. When I say plain A to C, it would be essentially just bottom network where you don't have this part that feeds in high level information, then you see we do better in 26 games, roughly the same on 30 games, and worse on 3 games. So the Atari benchmark has 59 games, we did all of them, and these are the results that, that we got. Um, okay, so now let me show you four videos that illustrate how the approach worked. So you've got uh, on the left hand side, the original view when you play the game as a human, and then on the right hand side, you've got the segmentation in a real time <coughs> that's being computed with the object mask and the, the, uh, uh, the motion vectors that's displayed here. Okay. So you can see that it does pick up the, the, the two paddle and the ball reasonably well. In the case of breakout, same thing. Sequest tends to do a good job too. And for beam rider, again, it's doing what it's expected. It picks up the most um, important things that are moving visually, which happen to be the beams, okay? But then it doesn't pick up um, some of these bullets and, and then the, the opponent most of the time. So we'll see that the results are not great. Okay. Any questions regarding those videos? Okay, so here are some performance curves. Um, so I'm only showing four. We did that for all 59 games. So if you go to my website, we've got a link with uh, all the information. So in fact, performance curves for all 59 games as well as videos for all 59 games. Um, here, we've got in yellow our technique. Um, and then we've got in blue the A to C baseline. And then the other curves, are other variants of the baseline. For instance, we can think of um, uh, this technique for doing the segmentation as really just a form of autoencoder with special structure. Now, what if we just use a plain autoencoder and forget about trying to explicitly segment out things? So here, that's, that's the red curve where you just have a plain autoencoder, and then it is it would be essentially doing some form of self-supervised learning, so it helps. But it doesn't help as much. Okay. Um, and then the purple one is when we do some transfer learning. Essentially, we learn how to segment, feed that information, but then do not continue training. So we essentially just initialize our network um, for um, deep reinforced learning with the information obtained from the segmentation. So that helps, but not as much as if we do joint training both networks. 
Okay, so, yeah, so you can see that um, we have pain results that show that um, we can train faster. The overall quality of the policies does not change. Like ultimately, all the techniques tend to converge more or less to the same good policies. Uh, it's just that we can do it faster with less, less data. Um, and again, uh, here's the example of being Rider, where the approach did not work well. So yellow is our approach, and, and then it gets beaten by uh, the blue, which is the, the baseline A to C. Any questions regarding this? Yeah. Uh, you agree that you are faster in finding the policy uh, in terms of the uh, number of frames. My question is that in with how much uh, expensive computation resources. <coughs> so you are adding more uh, parameters to your model, so your model is more expensive. So uh, what's the trade-off between these two? Yeah, that, that's a very good point. So our model is more expensive, and in fact, a lot more expensive. So here, um, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't have the details, but basically, Doing the training for this cannot be done in real time. Um, so, so then, in terms of processing frames, it normally, if you play the game, it would be roughly 30 frames per second, but our model could not be trained at that speed, so it had to be slowed down in, in that sense. Yeah, so there is definitely a computational cost here. Okay, so we also did an ablation study that shows um, what's the benefit of the different modifications that we made to um, SFM net, right? So here I explained earlier that, uh, for instance, we did curriculum learning, we use an L1 regularization, uh, we also use a different uh, loss function. So um, an interesting question is, what if we had just stuck with the SFM net that was proposed by Google? And then, so doing this would correspond to um, the red curve, no, oh, sorry. Um, actually, here I believe all we did is simply, okay, so we've got a new our approach, and the other curve is what if we remove one uh, of the modification at a time, and then so you can see the performance degrade, so all of these modifications were useful, uh, were helping to, 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 to obtain better results. Okay, so um, let me conclude. So to summarize, I explained how we can combine techniques from computer vision to do unsupervised segmentation so that now we can get reinforcement learning agents to essentially reason at a higher level than just plain pixels. And the beauty is because it's unsupervised, right, then um, it's no different than other types of deep reinforcement learning techniques. So we still start from pixels, Right, it's just that we've got this intermediate step that allows us to compute higher level information. And we can do this fairly quickly, just 1% of the frames. So the benefit is that then the optimization for the policy can be uh, improved. And then we also have now greater interpretability because we can also see what information it picks up. So that's how we can understand, for instance, why on the rider it, it doesn't seem to work well. And, and it's normal because it's, it's picking up information that's in fact useless predicting. Now, in terms of future work, there's lots of ways to extend this. Um, so the obvious one would be, let's extend this to 3D environments. So there's plenty of 3D video games. And uh, in fact, I had a couple of students start working on this. And that should be a no brainer, but this is where reinforced learning and especially deep learning is at heart. And, I must admit that at this point, none of those students have managed to obtain good results. So, so it should be possible. There's nothing uh, theoretically um, difficult here, but um, it's an art. Um, okay, earlier um, there were some suggestions made about how, now that we have the object, could we start reasoning about this? And it turns out that there is a whole literature in reinforcement learning that dates back at least 10 years what is known as object-oriented reinforcement learning. Now, that literature was always impractical in the sense that they always assumed that somehow somebody would provide object information and 
then they would do the reinforcement learning based on those objects. And now with this work, we are essentially making that literature practical because now for the first time, we have a way of obtaining object information. And, and now so it would be very interesting to go back to this literature and see if all these approaches that were proposed before now could be made practical and, and improved and, and so on. And then in terms of reasoning with objects, right? So once you've got object motion, you can start making predictions. So you could leverage physics-based dynamics, uh, especially if you've got balls moving and things like that. So there's a lot that could be done, and that would get us as well into um, model-based reinforcement learning. So I think that, yeah, there's, there's plenty that, that could be done here. Now, also in terms of future work, so you might see, well, Pascal, you know, these are just video games. You can tell me where I could use this that would be useful for society, a real industrial problem. So here, let me suggest that, um, let's say we want to do vehicle tracking and traffic control. So in fact, the original SFNet was tested in that context. And I've had a chance to talk with a few people in various organizations that are looking at smart cities. And one problem that they have is that they deploy a camera at an intersection. Uh, very often, they do supervise learning to do their um, object recognition. So they have a phase of collecting data, labeling it, then they deploy, and, and, and so on. And when you think about it, it's crazy because they have to do this for every single camera at each intersection because um, the setting is slightly different and, 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 and so on. And, and really, they, they just can't scale things. So now there's a possibility to really uh, scale this in the sense that you could deploy those cameras, you just turn them on, and then let them do the unsupervised learning so that they can gradually recognize to predict objects, motion, and, and so on in a self supervised way. And then after that, the traffic control is often, or at least could be often done with reinforcement learning. So, so then uh, this would be a perfect fit. Uh, so yeah, so if Ben was interested in that, uh, I'd definitely be uh, interested to talk more uh, with you. Okay, so um, yeah, so this summarizes what I, I talked about, and then let me stop here and I'll answer any further questions. So on the two types of game, the ones that uh, this method did better and the ones that it did worse, uh, the optimal policy at the end, was it the same? Even the games that it lost, uh, when you say it did worse, are you saying it just took more time to learn the optimal policy? Yeah, so generally speaking, uh, when our approach is picking up users' information that's we're just injecting noise, still because we've got uh, and uh, the bottom part of the network that's a classic deep reinforcement learning technique that will learn from our pixels what it needs, then typically that path eventually kicks in and, and really ends up dominating and the network eventually learns the, the same good policies, but it takes longer. So the biggest advantage is just faster policy optimization. Yeah. For any use case where time is not a problem, we can actually spend enough time and find the optimal policy, there is no benefit of using this. You could just train it using this. Absolutely. But, but then again, I would argue that uh, in the industry, or at least in most applications that people care about, um, there, it, I guess it's not so much time, but I would say it's interactions with the environment or the amount of data that's involved in. But, um, so, so yeah, so that's what is being addressed. Uh, so I definitely see in, in applications where there's a dynamic nature and the game changes all the time. So you do want to converge as fast as possible. But it comes at the cost of more computational resources that you need here. Plus the fact that dialysis doesn't hold for everything. So like your traffic example, there are a lot of moving objects. Not all of them are relevant to this. So it needs a lot of tuning. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so, in fact, originally when we did this work, what I would be really interested in doing is something similar, but in the context of a conversational agents. So, their reinforcement learning is used, and I've worked with some companies that are doing conversational agents, and the bottleneck in the industry for that is data. 
Uh, so people have like these great problems and then they, they just don't have enough data. Uh, typically you need on the order of hundreds of thousands of message response pairs to be trained. And then um, often you know you want to deploy based on either no data or, <laughs> or or just a little bit of data, right? And um, there's an interesting question about how do you do something self-supervised in NLP? Uh, NLP is a lot harder than computer vision yeah. in the sense that computer vision, I mean, it's giving you, um, like if you're, you're essentially sensing the, uh, the physical environment for which we already understand a lot, whereas NLP, you're essentially getting um, abstract symbols um, based on some human convention, yeah. but everything is abstract, and then the physical world is a lot, is much further. So, so here I think there's some interesting opportunities about how to do this in the context of, of NLP, which was the original foundation. But that's, that's yeah. very interesting. Have you had any success in, in that area, like high level yeah. representation for NLP or other domains where well, there is no images? Uh, um, for example, I work with industrial plants a lot. Uh, a lot of founders, a lot of actions, and at the end you're looking for best quality material coming up, for example. If you think about it, mine. Um, it's awesome to have an algorithm that can really adjust to dynamic situations and tell you this is the best actions that you need to take, the sequence of actions that you need to take, but there's not enough data to learn. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, have you had so, any results beyond? Uh, the classic computer vision domain? So, no, we haven't succeeded. Um, this was a whole literature now that's starting in terms of uh, structured embeddings for NLP. There's also a lot of work in terms of uh, uh, combining NLP with various forms of grounding through computer vision or other types of sensors that, that is very promising. But, but yeah, this is, this is a, you know, Really fundamental problem. Um, I'm wondering if there's the breakout uh, kind of more uh, like the, the segmentation layer is getting some feedback from the uh, enforcement learning, like so it's kind of getting a, a reward. Wouldn't you think it would kind of like turn down the importance of some pixels because it, uh, it's getting more reward? Like, is there a reason that wasn't happening? Or? Yeah, but that's a great point. So in fact, at the beginning, uh, when we did this, we thought, wonderful, we're gonna have the reward signal that will also tell us, hopefully, which objects are relevant. Yeah. And then in the case of being right, it should learn over time that those things are irrelevant, and, and, and so on. Now, again, the learning is at all. <laughs> in theory, we think this should have happened, but we didn't manage to get anything conclusive to demonstrate that in, in any environment. But I would think that you know, with uh, more trials and more ideas and so on, this should be possible. So, um, um, just on the 23rd slide. Um, 23rd slide, okay. Yeah, uh, so in, in here, uh, I see that, that within 4 million frames, it is, it is, it is able to learn some, uh, some policy, but is this same as what an A2C or a classic reinforcement learning algorithm would learn at 40 million, or, or basically the optimal policy learned by simple reinforcement learning engine and the optimal policy learned by that? What is the comparison between these two? Yeah, so they're, they're roughly similar. So in fact, here in each one of those plots, so we're comparing to plane A to C. Uh, plane A to C is the blue curve. Okay, so this is this is the blue curve here. So you see A to C is converging to the same thing. Uh, so here with more time, it will converge to the same thing. And here, okay, this is doing slightly better at the beginning. But generally speaking, uh, all of these approaches tend to converge more or less to the same thing. Mm -hmm. Quality of policy. So if you better means how fast. Yeah, exactly. So here that was just our goal. So can we do it faster with less interactions? So in one of the games where there was a moving object that was not important, you could not do as well, right? I don't know if it was beam rider or yeah, beam rider. Beam rider, yeah. Do you think you can have some sort of attention over moving objects to the 
which one of them is important and which one is not? Yes, so we in fact tried that. So at some point we tried putting in some attention layer and then we thought it was working, but then when we tried this across all 59 games, then we realized that uh, okay, maybe we got lucky on one game. <laughs> it wasn't working, generally speaking. Uh, and, then, uh, and then at some point, my sense removed the attention layer and then it was working better. So, so then, okay, let's not use the attention layer. But in theory, I agree with you that yes, we should be able to insert an attention layer and then it should use the rewards to learn over time um, what are the objects that, that are most relevant and pay attention to those. So here you use two frames to make your prediction of the next action. Yeah. And if I'm correct in that story, most of the time they use the last four frames. That's right. And yeah. there might be cases like computational AMS where you need even more just to reduce this current commercially observable world. So is this model and architecture uh, adaptable to a case where you need more than the two last frames? Yes, so yeah, that, that's a very good observation. So yeah, most of the literature uses four frames. And initially that's what we started with, but then when we looked at SFNet, SFNet needed only two frames. So then we figured, okay, well, let's try it with two frames and let's see what we get. And, and the results were just as good. So at that point we figured, well, we don't need those four frames and that's a good thing. Uh, but you're absolutely right too that if you're in a partially observable domain, then you would need like many more frames from the past going back to whatever information needs to be remembered. Um, so there, there have been several papers about uh, partially observable reinforcement learning, and then they tested it at Atari, and when you look at the results, they had to modify Atari to inject partial observability because Atari tends to be well observable so <laughs> so so then they, they essentially um skip some frames and drop some frames to induce partial observability so so terry generally speaking is fully observable so we have time for one more question we then i can take the questions uh, so you mentioned the, the difficulty to move into 3d and you mentioned like the difference in approach between the 2d model and the experiment you've been trying to in 3D? Uh, so, so for 3D, it was mostly a question of going back to the original SFMNet, and then uh, really, I, I, I think it's just a fact that this is an art more than a science, and then um, um, the students who tried this did not succeed, but I would think that you know somebody with the right ingenuity, the right skills, and and, and it's on the right intuitions uh, should succeed. Using that math, for example, I think this is yeah. trying to yeah. Okay, that's time for scholarship.